I had to download a, a new app on my phone this week uh, because something really aggravating was happening. And it's something that didn't bug me for a long time and all of a sudden started bugging me. But how many of you, uh, some of you might look forward to this uh, every morning. I've, I've learned that and I'm kind of shifting in this direction now. But how many of you, when you open up Facebook for the first time in the morning, get excited to see the time hop, the kind of the things that you might have shared from in years past? Have y'all noticed that before? Yeah, I see some hands raised. So I didn't really care for that for a long time. And in the last few months, I'm like, you know, that's neat. Um, that's a lot of fun. And I did the math uh, because uh, I've been on social media for a long time. I've been on Facebook since 2004. Uh, there's a lot of, I put a lot of junk on there. Sometimes I don't want to remember it. Sometimes I do. Um, I've been on Twitter since 2006 and like Instagram since 2008. It's like I've got a bunch of memories on there. And the older I get, the kind of more nostalgic I get, the more I kind of want to, hey, that was really cool. I like that. I was really skinny back then. <laughs> it's like, oh yeah, I need to share. Yes, I did look like but my, my phone and like, you know, you, you hear the conspiracy theories that Apple, like it's not a conspiracy, I p completely believe they do it, but they, they're building redundancy into their phones. And like after it's a certain age, it's just not gonna work as well as it used to. Well, lately, every time I try to like share the time hop thing, it crashes my Facebook app. Jerks. <laughs> and so I went and down, I, I realized like, oh, there's an app that just does this. So I went and downloaded the time hop app. And, and for the last week, I've kind of gotten obsessed with like, oh, I, I had to go back and do you realize we, we forget passwords now? It's like, I didn't I have no idea what my Instagram password was. I'm going there and, trying to, and I figured it out and I plugged it all in like every morning now. Like it's just really fun to see all that stuff. And whatever algorithm they figured out, they, there's somebody a lot smarter than I am. Uh, there's people in this room that are smart enough to figure this out. But they also, they show the fun stuff. They, they figured out what does it mean to show the fun stuff. And it makes me just, I, I've, the last couple of weeks I've been enjoying it a lot. And, and every year, the last Sunday in January, we kind of take Sunday morning to talk about what the last year was like. We kind of try, we time hop with ourselves each year. And so I wanted to share a couple of fun time hops with you this morning uh, before we talk about 2018 and, and some of the things that we're thinking about. Uh, so I'm going to read these with y'all, but they, we popped up. This, this year was really fun. And 2017, this is some of the stuff that happened. This is some of the stuff that you were able to do. Um, in 2017, we grew. Our 2016 average attendance was 121. In 2017, it was, it was, it was uh, 160. Only 16% of churches in America are growing and, and, and you're one of them. Uh, we're able to do that because you invite people, because you share things on Facebook, because you engage and you have fun at church on Sunday morning. You know, the longest time I did not have fun on church on Sunday morning. I was a preacher too. That's not a very good thing to admit to you, is it? But we have fun on Sunday morning. That's because you have fun on Sunday morning. We have some other fun stuff going on. Uh, we hired Sarah McBroom as our kids director and Lindsay Killen to manage volunteers. This was a big milestone for us. We, we set that as a goal at the end of 2016 and said we wanna raise enough money to be able to make this happen and to pay for the, the salaries for a full year. And it, it's so much nicer knowing we've got people that are thinking specifically about serving. We have people that are thinking specifically about all those, the one third of our congregation that are the kids back there. That's awesome, it's something that you were able to do. It's a fun thing to share together. Uh, we started our cooperative relationship with St. Andrews. That was something that we were praying about at the very beginning of the year. And over the, over the last 12 months, we've seen that expand. So we are in this ministry relationship with another existing church in our area. And we share resources. We share some spaces. Uh, we, we do a lot of things that churches don't normally do together. It's kind of fun to hear a story about two churches actually liking mm -hmm. each other and cooperating. And St. Andrews is, is, is our family now. Uh, we have that part of that deal is also that they sold us five acres of their property for us to build our future home on. That land purchase was completed a couple of years ago. We could not have done that without that relationship and the fact that we had the ability to pay cash for that land. That's something that is, you've done, that you've done amazing things. And the next thing we've is understood this year is we had 11 baptisms, six adult professions of faith. Uh, we, we celebrated a lot of people making decisions for Jesus and coming into relationships with him. That's something the church should be doing and we enjoyed that. It's kind of, we were telling, back there this morning, we were telling stories about the baptism. Uh, Lion's family, I think this is the time we had to dump the 20 pounds of ice to cool down. Like we, 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 we used to have too cold of a baptistry and then it turned out to be really, really hot. And so we had to dump ice in that Sunday. Some of the fun stories we have of our life together here. Um, the next thing up is uh, our youth went to summer camp for the very first time. The only thing they had to pay for was the cost of registration. 
And one of the things we realized last year is we want to invest in future generations. We want to invest in them being in the environments for them to experience God. And so we were able to do that. Y'all were able to do that. So something we can celebrate together. We have 65 different kids a month are attending Foundry Kids. So you get a peek back there of, of hallways turned into to classrooms. This is a big investment for us as a church. It's a big investment of time and of resources because our kids matter. And we want those kids to have the best experience, the best understanding of who Jesus is at their age. Something we saw grow in 2017 as well. We found new places to serve. Uh, I'm gonna talk about this feeding thing more, but we uh, began a relationship with the Sterlington Food Pantry and the Desired Street Shelter. Uh, we disasterly, we raised over $5,000 in 72 hours for Hurricane Harvey relief. We were able to provide a tremendous amount of resources nearly instantly, which was a big thing for folks that were affected in that situation. And just the last one, our Christmas project. We had over 42 kids in this community have a fantastic Christmas because of you, because of your generosity. We're also in another situation where we're able to partner with other folks around town to do this together. Because it's really just not, it's not about us. It's about all of us gathering together. And so it's this quick time hop of the things that we were able to accomplish, the things that you were able to accomplish, the ways that things grew and the way that things uh, changed. So every year we come together back on this last Sunday of January and we really just talk about our vision. We talk about who God has called us to be. And at Foundry, we say it, we put it on every single piece of like t-shirts and cups we can find, but we say Jesus is big enough. And we believe in that. We believe that Jesus being big enough is something that deeply matters to us as people, but also matters to this community. And our mission is to create environments for people to experience a God big enough for all their needs. We realize that experiences and relationships are the ways that we are changed. And so we want to think intentionally about the chances that we might have and the chances that those that we might not know have to learn and to grow deeper in who Jesus is. And uh, we, we, we find ourselves just continuing to go back to the same verse in John. If you've been around Foundry for a while, you might be sick of this verse or you might be just as fascinated with it as I am. But John 1, 14 will be on the screens behind me. This is where we're going to have our conversation around today. But this is, this is what uh, scripture says. So the word became human and made his home among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness and we have seen his glory, the glory of the father's one and only son. You know, in the past, uh, when we read this verse, we, we think about different things. Uh, uh, for a long time, we talked about the whole idea of the word becomes flesh and made his home among us. Another translation says, the word became flesh and moved into the neighborhood that God's presence comes right here to where we are and he, he, he enfolds us with his presence and dwells among us and all the things that that means. And we've also talked before about what does it mean to see God as, as full of unfailing love and faithfulness and the, the implications that has in our life to understanding what true love is and how it means to experience true love and how faithfulness means that things are done when they say they're gonna be done, that we can, that we can trust, that's a huge thing. And this year, I, I, we've come back to this uh, several times already this year, but I want us to think about that idea of glory. That we have seen his glory, and the glory of the Father's one and only Son. And I'll tell y'all what glory, like that is this ball of, uh, this tangled ball of ideas that's really, really interesting. And it's really, really complicated. In the last few weeks, we were talking about G the temple and, and Jesus in the temple and the temple in the Old Testament. We we're talking about this temple a bunch. We've been uh, thinking about this idea that when the presence of God is somewhere that big things happen. But glory is so much more than just this idea of the presence of God, especially the way John's trying to communicate to us this morning. You know, we're used to like, uh, if we've seen the Ten Commandments, or if you're a little bit younger, you've seen uh, the Prince of Egypt, the, the cartoon. Or we're, okay, God's glory is like a pillar of fire that moves throughout the desert. I really wish I could see a pillar of fire. Like, have you ever, I, when I was a kid in, like in youth camp, this adult one time, uh, if you're younger, please don't listen to me right now, or your parents can help you out with this later on. We went to that like, coffee creamer burns. It was like the, the favorite youth group trick, like, you make a pillar of fire. And it's like, yeah, don't teach me how to do this at camp when I'm, there's not enough adults supervised around. We're used to seeing God as the, the, this, this smoke. Like we read the Old Testament when God's glory is around, it's like thunderstorms and lightning and, and all sorts of crazy stuff. And it, it, it natural, uh, the, 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 the weather systems are doing uh, all of these weird things and it's in this way like we can't say that he's not here. 
like things happening in front of people in unavoidable ways that they cannot argue against the validity and physical presence around them. Old Testament, we also see conversations, ideas of glory uh, being the veiled presence of God, that the whole smoke thing was to simply hide who God was from people who, uh, that, that, that could not handle seeing what God was like. But that glory in the Old Testament, the sacred idea of glory uh, was as proven, experienced encounters with the visible reality of God and we we go into the New Testament and talk about glory and and we see that it's it's, it's about honor it's about uh, truthfulness that uh, it's about making a proper representation and then if we kind of start untangling the ball even a little bit more um, we get a very interesting idea that that glory is about people's opinion of what is great So you've got this big, huge, long chain of things and this this idea that has traversed like people groups over thousands of years and then you get to John who's trying to tell us something really, really different. So he speaks about glory in a way that that no really other book in the Bible does. And there's a reason why he's doing that. John's John's kind of different. John was was, uh, the, the last disciple of Jesus to be alive. Uh, John was the only disciple that was not martyred. John had lived a lot longer than all of his buddies had. So you imagine what his life had looked like, uh, uh, seeing his friends, the people that he experienced Jesus with slowly die, and some of them killed for their faith. And then you get to the point where you're the last one standing. And then you live, and then you live, and then you live. And at the, at the edge of his life, he makes a decision, I, I want to communicate things about Jesus to people but I want to communicate them in the way that I've realized now where it's been a long time since Jesus has died. And and, and John is thinking about the the end game. He's thinking about what's going out long. You see in the New Testament in certain places, uh, Paul and other disciples talk about, they're expecting Jesus to come back any day now. And here you've got John and he's lived a lot longer than those guys have. And he's realizing this might not be any day. So let me think about this in a way that, that speaks of time differently. So John takes all these ideas and this idea of, of proper representation and what this idea of truth to one person means and combines it with this Old Testament concept of something that's so loud and big and wild in front of you, like you can't deny what's happening. And then he starts speaking about the glory of God being carried by Jesus. And he talks about Jesus in a way unique to all the other gospel writers. He does not slowly reveal what, who Jesus is. Like from the very beginning, from the very get-go, what he's talking about right now in chapter one is this is the truth transcendent resurrected Lord who is before time and is during time and will be here after time and this is what life is like when he came into the world and hung out with people for a while so he takes all of these things and just mashes them together and he realizes and communicates to us that glory is a matter of belief glory is a matter of experience he writes in, 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 in verse 10, uh, right before 14, he says this, he, didn't come, he came into the very world he created, but the world didn't recognize him. He came to his own people, and even they rejected him. But to all who believed him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. They're reborn, not with a physical birth resulting from human passion or plan, but a birth that comes from God. So the world became human and made him his home among us. That belief opens up the completely, a completely different level of possibilities than what we might originally assume. That glory is this marker of physical, deliberate, experienced truth that can't be argued with the person who's experienced it in a deliberate and real and truthful way. So John set up a completely different story, different end game, messes with time, And he starts talking to us that power has been promised for those who've experienced belief. So we jump to the very end of the book and John kind of tells us why he's doing this and tells us why he decided to tell us to say the things he did and to communicate the things he did. If you were here with us this summer, remember we talked about the seven signs of Jesus and how just consistently all along there was just this unfolding of the power of belief. And John writes this in chapter 20. The disciples saw Jesus do many other miraculous signs in addition to the ones recorded in this book. But these are written 
so that you may continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing in him, you will have life by the power of his name. So all of this, all this belief in this new world, belief in this world that Jesus has has shown and exposed to people around him throughout his life. And that when you believe that you have power in this new way of life, that your eyes are opened as Jesus was opening this life. And that glory is identifying truth in this new life. That when we see the glory Jesus has, we realize this is the same glory that God the Father has been showing to his people with his presence. And it's no longer veiled, it's no longer hidden. It's it's right there in front of us. It is in our neighborhood. And it's open and it's accessible to all of us. And, and what's, why, so you kind of are bookending. These are like the edges of, of John. It's the, like the, the outside cover and the back cover. In the middle, there's these two passages and they're talking about power and, and, and signs and glory causing belief. If we go to the middle of John, we find a completely different passage that talks about how, uh, uh, about how belief causes power and glory and signs how it offers it to us and something we've read also uh, several times this year but it's John uh, chapter uh, 14 I tell you the truth anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done and even greater works because I'm going to be with the father and you can ask for anything in my name and I will do it so that the Son can bring glory to the Father. Yes, ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. And we, we read this verse without kind of like f- f- seeing the nature of what John's trying to communicate throughout this whole telling of the story of Jesus in a new way. We see that like, oh, sweet, there's cool stuff involved. What kind of cool stuff do I want today? Then we ask for this cool stuff, and we get frustrated because we think that this verse is about us just getting cool stuff. And all of us like cool stuff. We all probably have a list of of cool things that we would like. But that would be a grand adventure in missing this point. So another one just sees these markers that John is telling us of of this new way and this new life. And he talks about works. And works are are a funny thing uh, in the church. You hear people talk about works and like, well, we shouldn't be doing works. Our salvation doesn't come through works. It gets complicated. What we see is that works or display of activity, they're a practical proof. These signs, these miracles that Jesus was doing was simply pointing to the reality of he shared glory with his Father, that he he was the transcendent God in flesh right here with people. We read this and then we begin to think deeper and get past the whole where's my cool stuff idea and see that our practical life in this world has a point. That the things that we do speak to the reality of this glory, the reality of this power. This isn't just about I'm going to be good and hopefully I can get random cool stuff from God because he likes me enough. But that we are doing the things that Jesus is doing. And that when we do these things and we can do these things because of the way the truth of who God is has been exposed in our life that our belief in something bigger can lead us to even bigger things. And so we've just drank through a fire hose for like the last 15 minutes, like whole Gospel of John as quickly as possible. But uh, just to think about that and to think about what that holds for us in our life, what, what, is it, what does Jesus' truth mean, especially to us as a church? You know, the, the, the truth about the action of Jesus and his life, his glory, it, it causes the church to exist on the same plane of existence as Jesus. It's a way of us saying, you know what? I, I, these old rules never really worked out for me. I'm going to live and I'm going to direct myself by the rules of Jesus. Because he's doing something altogether different, altogether bigger than I am. This, this glory that Jesus shared with his father, this, this glory was different. It was something not of this world. And when Jesus comes, he comes and dwells among us, we have an accessibility and access to this glory. 
God's not far off from us. God now offers himself in the realest way possible to us. No matter where we are, no matter where we've come from, no matter what we have in our story, he offered himself right there to us. So this life with Jesus is a life of invitation to truth. It's a, uh, that where we understand the truth of the old world, we understand the truth of the new world. We realize this is the things that have tripped me up for long enough. It doesn't work out that way. I see the truth of this new life, this new world that Jesus is laying out for me. And what the paradox of this is that sometimes these decisions we make to, live, to choose to live in Jesus' world here will look like lunacy to other people. We'll make decisions that just don't make sense. We will do things sometimes that just don't make sense. One of the biggest questions that, that I was asked and probably some of you were asked for the last several years at Foundry is there's a lot of Monroe people who were driving to Sterling to go to church on Sunday morning. And as we began praying and looking for permanent space, people were always saying, man, listen, y'all could get like some commercial property in Monroe a lot cheaper than trying to find a land in Sterlington. Like, why don't, almost everybody who goes to Foundry works in Monroe, why don't you, y'all are, just go to Monroe. And for years we were telling them, you know, we don't know, but we feel like Jesus wants us in Sterlington. And it, it, we looked like lunatics. I would try to explain this to people and they're like, this makes no sense to me, but okay, I'll trust you on this from folks who are outside of our church. You know, we see this year, we understand more of why this God has given us this call to be here in Sterlington. Us as a church praying together to live into the life of Jesus and the truth of this, this new way that's here. But Jesus and the act of how he comes to us and the fancy word for this is incarnation, that how he comes to us, it's a revealing many times of the only truth that's actually strong, strong enough for us to attach ourselves to. We've attached ourselves to other stuff. Sometimes it holds for a little while, sometimes it holds for a long while, but inevitability, if we're not attaching ourselves to Jesus, it's going to break, the line is going to break. And we can trust him. And the action that we have of, of, of anchoring ourselves to Jesus, that stabilization that we find to him, is we, we stabilize ourselves by participating in what he has going on. Like if we just say we're trusting Jesus, but we're living in this old world, we're, we're not going to see the benefits. We're going to feel like we're lunatics ourselves sometimes. But to believe and to have something bigger, we need to see and understand a bigger life, a bigger world, and a bigger Jesus. We have to put ourselves in situations to where we need Jesus to be big enough. That's not just a coping mechanism. That's a vision mechanism. It's about us saying we want to put ourselves in situations to follow you that are frankly going to scare us sometimes. Because we need you to be big enough. You know, all this week, as we're just reading one, over and over, John 1, 14, the word became flesh, and he, 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 he dwelled among us. And we've seen his glory, the glory of a father's only son. is full of unfailing love. And I'm just sitting there and just rolling through my head and rolling through my head and rolling through my head. And I'm, like, doing, like, the, the nerdy, like, preacher Bible work to get ready for the sermon. And I'm sitting here, tra- I'm like, the, the, what, the, this, if I had to translate this verse, like, in the new Chad version or whatever it was, it was the living God came to live among us. And because of that, a bunch of wild stuff might happen. And I don't want to live in a way, and I'm sure you don't want to live in a way that stops that wild stuff from happening. We want, we want to see this. We want to experience Jesus at this level. And so a couple things for us to think about as we, as we go on. And if you've been here before for our, our conversations in January, uh, you I don't lay out some stuff, but what I want to do is I want us to think about what the future could be like. But two things for us to realize, this is us personally, but also us as a church, that we can't believe if we aren't believing. That's an active state. That wherever we are inside of time, Jesus is right alongside of us. That we can't come up with something that he hasn't seen before. We can't come up with something that he can't be with us and, and live through us. Wherever we are, he is right there. He came in time to become every single thing 
that we need to experience of him. Believing something bigger is an active belief. And the second thing is we can't follow Jesus if we aren't following. It's just as active. You know, for us, we uh, made the decisions of trying to think and pray and, and take a long time to decide where we feel God's asking us to be. Talked about the, the, the lunacy already of us saying, no, we need to be in Sterlington. And then uh, when that land at St. Andrew's offered to us, and it was, it's four miles further up 165. Some of you might remember me saying, hey, listen, if that's a big deal for you, I need you to email me this week and say, Chad, that's too far for me to drive. Not joking, y'all remember that? Like I, thankfully, I, I got a lot of emails back from people and not a single one of them said, no, that's too far. It was like, hey, three miles is nothing for what's going on at this church. It looks like lunacy. But then let me tell you about a fun story. I was uh, with some St. Andrews folks about a month ago. We're like literally getting the last bits of that paperwork for that land together. And, um, and I heard some more of the story of why and when they bought that land. They bought that land 20 years ago. And, uh, and some of you know this, some of you don't know this. They sold us that land for what they paid for it 20 years ago. If you know what commercial property is in Sterlington, you know it's outrageous. And like this should have been illegal how cheap we got this land. And it was because of their generosity. But one other, I remember St. Andrews told me, and this was an, at this moment I was like, you know what? I get every single business right now. I said, Chad, we feel like our job was to buy that land to wait for y'all to need it. It was 20 years ago. Think where you were 20 years ago. I was in high school. I was a senior in high school 20 years ago. Like the only thing I cared about 20 years ago was making sure my car ran and really hoping that Allison Chains had a new record coming out next year. <laughs> we bought that land because we knew Jesus would need it, is what was told me. And over this last year, we've been praying and praying and praying, Jesus, help us to really understand where we need to be. Last year, I talked about distinctiveness. And what we also saw this year is now when people ask, well, why are y'all in Sterlington? I feel like I can lay it out. Like, this is why. Boom, 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 boom. But we fell into a feeding ministry this year. With our relationship with St. Andrews, one of the natural things was, you know, we kind of need help with the food pantry. Can y'all come help with the food pantry some? It's like, yeah, absolutely we can. And then the Desired Street. And some of y'all served for Desir Street. We, we put out a spread for Desir Street on Thanksgiving. Like we, the way the calendar fell, Foundry had Thanksgiving dinner at Desir Street. And like almost everybody was out of town. And we put down this legit Thanksgiving spread. I now firmly believe Jesus called us to be on the north end of this parish because when you look at the poverty issues and the issues of feeding people in the north side of Washita Parish, on the south side of Morehouse Parish, on the east side of Union Parish, right where we are, that it's huge and it's gigantic, that Jesus put us right there to place ourselves in a ministry of making sure other people have full bellies because we are uniquely able to do that that we uh, have the resources to provide for that, that we have enough uh, younger folks that can go work uh, late at night in it. We have some folks that are a little bit older that can work in the middle of the day in it. Like we are uniquely posited to be part of that. And I'll tell y'all, uh, when all of that finally clicked was two weeks ago, uh, I get a notification on Facebook at 10.45 at night. I'm almost in bed and somebody's on a Washita swap and sell and talk about how they don't have any food in their house and five kids. And I, I, all my, my phone starts getting notifications because people are commenting on that thread. You know, Foundry feeds people. And they were here in Sterlington. And I didn't have to do a lick of work on that. That was other folks. And what was funny was almost none of them actually go to our church. What we've always said is we wanna follow and we want to trust and we want to have the ability when we know that things are happening that Jesus is going to show them to us. We've prayed for Jesus to give us the people and the relationships that you want us to have. If you're here in this room, you're a result of, of, our, of our teams and our leadership and people years ago praying, Jesus, we trust that you are going to bring us the exact people that we need to be in relationship with and that we need to be in ministry with. So to finish today, to talk about what does the next year look like? Because the next year is going to look very different. 
we're probably not going to be in this gym very much longer. We're, we're going into a capital campaign at the end of the spring. That's going to be really different. We had to raise $25,000 to put in the parking lot in December. We're going to have to raise a lot more than $25,000 this year. But we believe this place and this ministry is where we're called to and that we will see new places and new ministries if we're following Jesus close enough. So in closing, I'm just going to point to you four questions that we have used almost since the very beginning. I'm not, I don't lay out goals and, and ideas on Sundays like this. But what I, I invite you to do is to pray as we pray. And to pray is the way that when Foundry was 20 people in a backyard prayed, and to pray the way that Foundry does today in this date and in this place. Four questions. What would Jesus be passionate about in our community? What would Jesus be passionate about? The second thing is what issues would Jesus care about in our community? The third thing is, where would Jesus spend his time in our community? Where he spend time in the village of Sterlington? Where he spend his time in where we're kind of in the area we are right now? Where would Jesus spend his time in Monroe or in West Monroe or in Columbia or Ravel or Bastrop or any of the other towns we have people who come for? Where would Jesus spend his time? And the last thing is this, is how would Jesus reach people? Friends, this is about faithfulness and being a faithful people. And if we're faithful, we don't have to worry because we realize the next big thing is right around the corner and Jesus will show it to us.